Hello my friends, today Joel is talking to David, the CTO of Catalog, and they discuss David's journey from running the supercomputing division of IBM to CTO at a startup working on DNA computers. Use cases for DNA data storage, search, and computing, and insight into what it looks like in practice to store and manipulate data using chemistry. All of this right here, right now, on the Modern CTO Podcast. So uh, I want to give, you know, you know all of what we do. We hang out, we talk, you know all of that. So, and we had a great first episode where we talked a lot about DNA storage, but real quick, just to set the, the tone, can you give a little bit of your background and how you got involved with Catalog and what it is? Sure. Um, from a background perspective, uh, most of my career was spent working with IBM. I was managing the supercomputer business for IBM for the last 25 years or so. So um, very much high-end scientific computing, uh, leading edge, cutting edge kind of stuff. Um, a lot of work with IBM research to take uh, research ideas and turn them into product. About a year and a half ago, I joined Catalog because I saw a, a new opportunity to really help transform the computing industry by taking this so-called blank sheet of paper that uh, occupies what goes on in chemical computing and through catalog really create a different model uh, for how people can approach problems associated with data, search, compute, and so on. And then like, how did you meet the people at catalog? Well, actually, they were looking for a CTO, and so a recruiter reached out to me, and we started having conversations, and the rest is history. Nice. So you have a, you have a pretty good risk profile, right? You saw that this was an opportunity, and, and you saw where the market was going, and you said, I want to be a part of this. Yeah, I think um, when, when I think about it from that perspective, I think of it um, as the adrenaline rush from working in an integrative domain and doing something that has a material impact on um, the future of computing. So from that perspective, it was a pretty easy call on my part um, to engage on that. Nice. Well, man, I'm excited. I firmly believe this is the future. I'm pumped. I've been talking with everybody about, um, I think you said it was called uh, write once, read never, one of the use cases for DNA storage. And then my producer told me something, you guys were working on DNA computing. And at first I was like, my mind was blown, but then later I was out on a walk and I thought, you know what? We talked about being able to search DNA to be able to do like all of these different things with DNA. And so computing would be a natural progression to move up from storage. I don't understand it though. How do you differentiate computing uh, and storage with DNA? Okay, so um, d we'll define a couple of terms here um, with respect to information, first of all. So imagine, if you will, the uh, encoding of a whole bunch of data that you have available to you in DNA. And it sits, in our case, in a pool or somewhere. So it's in liquid, just molecules floating around, uh, representing all the data that you've encoded. If you want to search on data, all you're doing is retrieving what you already have. If you want to compute on data, you're applying some sort of transformational idea to the data you have to create new data. So simple example, you encode the numbers one, two, three, and four. You can search and you can pull out the numbers one, two, three, and four. But now I apply a transformation to this data called addition. So it's one plus two plus three plus four. And now if I'm doing my addition correctly, I can now withdraw the number 10 or create the number 10, which didn't previously exist in my data store. And I can now add it to my data. I've created a new piece of information. That information is labeled 10. So that's a trivial example of what we mean by compute separate from search. So what we're doing is both. Uh, we have the means chemically to search for data out of encoded um, uh, DNA, but we also have, we're beginning to develop chemistry and crudely put chemical instructions, if you will, that can operate on data and produce the result as well. So a trivial example would be 
I've encoded a whole bunch of numerical data into DNA. Question, what's the biggest number I have encoded? Answer, we've developed chemistry that can go and search through all that and identify what the biggest number is. So that's a trivial example, but it's an example of direction that we're taking. Now, instruction is a bit of a stretch here. Uh, when we work in the chemistry world, we use language that's evocative of what we're all familiar with in the electronic world, except the words have slightly different meaning. So we don't have compilers, we don't have languages, file systems don't exactly look the same. You have DNA just floating around in a, in a liquid. They don't, they're, they're not uh, tied to a physical structure like you have with tape or, or hard disk, even flash memory, things like that. But we use that language because it's the easiest way for people to get a grasp on what we're doing. So in essence, yes, we're demonstrating the ability to operate on data. We're doing it entirely with chemistry. Our media for facilitating this is DNA. And we're developing automated tools to do this at scale. So this is beyond benchtop kind of experimentation, but to do it at scale on problems of conventional size. And what I mean by that is not a toy problem. Toy problems have been referenced in the literature. You'll find people do it in universities and so on. No, we want to solve a problem using the amount of data that you would come in contact with in the real world and to solve it using DNA instructions, if you will, in a time frame that resonates with the needs in a real world. And that's what we're doing. I'm a super visual person. And so mm -hmm. there's a huge knowledge gap. I'm not an expert in this topic by any means. What is the, I guess the best question I could come up with is what's the interface? So back to your example, one plus two plus three plus four, what does it look like to input it? And what does it look like when you get the result back out? Okay. So from a chemistry perspective, um, we would create um, a, 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 a chemical process, if you will. It might be multiple steps in nature, but uh, the chemical process would be applied against this body of DNA that encompasses the data that we've encoded. So think of it this way. Think of one beaker consisting of all this data embodied in DNA and another much, much smaller beaker that also has fluid in it and some so-called DNA instructions in it. We would take that second beaker, dump it into the first one, and then uh, we would invoke chemical process that would cause the removal of the right kinds of results from that body of information to produce the answer. Now, in practice, that's, that's the way you would do it on the bench with just chemists. In practice, in our case, we would use software, conventional software, to orchestrate the operation of our data encoding machine called Shannon to produce a particular set of DNA molecules that would then find its way into a pooler that, it, that exists at the tail end of the writing process that would cause this chemical reaction to take place. Then we would reduce the volume of liquid in the, in the pooler we would extract the DNA molecules in a very conventional way that would represent the answer. And we would then convert that answer if we wanted to in electronic form. So that you get a, a readout on a piece of paper, on a disk drive, on a tape or something like that. But all the computational activity, all the manipulation would take place in a world of chemistry, not in the world of electronics. Okay, so I'm going to tell you like one of my perspectives of it, you can tell me how I'm wrong or right mm -hmm. or if I'm on the right path. Sure. Um, I've been noticing uh, emergence of very specific sort of like GPUs or specific chips and processing. For example, there's this company Grok and they make this very specific chip that's good for this one type of processing of data. Yeah. And so you're seeing these applications specific, you know, the quantum computing type devices. And it's almost as if like the process is creating these like little application specific organic things, but it's just in a much faster cycle. You're not actually like, manufacturing this whole chip and doing production, sending it out. It's like you're, you're making these little physical things that can then process the data, like filter through the data. Right. So, so DNA is physical, right? Um, just as, you know, 60, 70 years ago, when you looked at, um, 
computer storage, you have little pieces of uh, magnetic material and you flip a, a unit from one side to another magnetically to represent an action or a piece of data or something like that. Um, all we're doing is manipulating DNA in the same kind of way. And, um, and so this is taking place in a physical sense. It's just that the physical media are these molecules of DNA. Now, with respect to your comment about the, the specialization, it's, that's actually an important observation you've made because over the last 10 years, um, there has been in the computer world, the observation that you look at workflows and workflows are capable of de being decomposed into different pieces. So for example, there might be um, a phase in the workflow that's data manipulation, then there's the application of algorithm, then there's an application of more data manipulation, the invocation of another algorithm, visualization, result, et cetera. So the compartmentalization of these activities has given rise to an interest in the deployment of specialized kinds of devices like GPUs, as you pointed out. And now people are doing acceleration by gaining together ARM chips and this and that. But the ideas are fundamentally the same regardless of the technology. It's the decomposition of the workflow that's critical. Another way to say it would be the following. You're not going to use a quantum computer to do payroll application, right? Because the nature of computation and so on that goes on in payroll is perfectly fine for a classic von Neumann kind of architecture that is embodied in your, your laptop PC or what have you. There's no advantage that will accrue to you by virtue of the invocation of a quantum capability. On the other hand, there are other applications, encryption, decryption, things like that, where von Neumann architectures are, are constrained in terms of their utility, and then you invoke a quantum computer. It's the same with GPUs. GPUs are an amalgamation of vector processing units. So if you can find a domain in your workflow that invokes that, and certainly visualization was that for a long time, but now people are using GPUs for um, very heavily quantitative algorithms, the opportunity to invoke that gives you a real advantage. It speeds things up quite dramatically. But it speeds it up quite dramatically in a context of a workflow and, uh, you know, we've, we've talked about Amdahl's law for many, many years in the world of scientific computing. You can take an application and you can render parts of it parallel and invoke a supercomputer, but the overall time spent in the application is still going to be capped by the parts that you can't render in parallel. So if it's some serial um, I.O. process, for example, well, that's it. I mean, you're never going to get faster than the fastest you can make that particular step run. Now, this has been going on for 10 years, more or less. And what it's done for us in the DNA world is it's taken away the intrinsic resistance on the part of clients and customers to experiment with new and emerging technology. 10 years ago, you'd have not seen anybody say, well, what I want to do today is I want to implement GPUs and I want to implement quantum, and I want to do all these other things. No, back then, 10 years ago, people would say, Moore's law governs all. I'm just going to use commodity processors, and that's it. Well, what's happened? Well, Moore's law has been shown to be dramatically constrained, um, and there's this gradual revelation in the minds of a lot of people that if you focus on workflows and understand how you can apply the best tool or technique to different elements in the workflow, in aggregate, you'll get a much better result. So the removal of that reluctance to embrace new technologies pioneered by the GPU and quantum guys bodes well for the chemistry guys, right? So now people would say, well, why not look at DNA computing? Oh, it's exotic. No, no, exotic went out the window when you guys started experimenting with GPUs and quantum computers <laughs> and so on. You've already embraced exotic. Right, so this is just another form. So why not why not look at this? So um, that that's benefited the DNA community quite dramatically. Do you have any good examples of of how people could use this or specific industries? Oh, sure. Uh, and Catalog in particular is engaged with a number of commercial enterprises to to both showcase and demonstrate the technology. 
but also to collaborate with them on particular applications. So it falls into three categories. It's DNA as storage per se. So there are some companies, think of companies that are engaged in um, long-term archival kinds of needs, uh, maybe for historical purposes or so on. And uh, they want to keep things around for 100 years or 200 years or whatever the case might be. Um, and maybe it's art, maybe it's film, maybe it's music, doesn't matter what the case is, but people have a, a need to just preserve things effectively forever. And the longevity of DNA supports that. The density of storage encoding is, makes it uh, reasonable and cheap. You don't have to build a warehouse, you know, a single room might handle it. Low energy profile might support what your need is, et cetera, et cetera. And if you need to keep something for a year, two years, a hundred years, a thousand years, there's also no obsolescence. So, you know, it's different than we have today where you go from LTO 6 to LTO 9 and tape, and suddenly you can't read a cartridge with the new technology and you've got to do all sorts of, um, uh, of updates on, on what you have installed. DNA molecules are DNA molecules. As long as we preserve the means by which you decode it, which we can do also in DNA, um, you're fine. You know, a thousand years from now, you'll say, oh, it's a DNA molecule. Here are the decoding uh, instructions. Let me decode it. I see what we have here. Thank you very much. Right? No problem with that. So that's category A. Category B is search. It says, I've encoded data. Now I need to find it. Well, imagine, if you will, a world where all data for archi archival is on tape, and you're looking to find one little piece of data out of all your archival tape. The way tape works is you process everything serially until you find what you're looking for. One of the advantages of DNA storage is serial processing goes out the window. I just create a probe of what I want. I throw it into my mass of data, and I pull out exactly what I'm looking for. I don't have to examine every piece of data. I can simply extract the one piece of data that I'm looking for. So it's non-serial in nature. Random access is you know, uh, the standard that we have in the DNA world. So from a search perspective, it holds a promise of searching data in whatever form that takes, by the way, you know, compound searches, whatever, um, being able to do that very directly, very efficiently. And then the third category is transformation, where you're actually manipulating data quantitatively. And here what we're looking at are applications like digital signal processing. There's some evidence that we can make some progress in um, in training models and machine learning. There are examples that we're working on where um, it's sort of a combination of search and compute and what we call sort of an identification problem. Uh, is the person that just walked into the airport a terrorist or not a terrorist? There's information I have to search. There's information I have to process. Uh, can I do that as well? And DNA is particularly good at looking at things that don't require extraordinary precision. So, for example, a photo. Do I need to be absolutely precise with every pixel that represents your image? No, I can allow some things to fall out. Not a big deal. I can extrapolate the differences and I have a clear identification of who you are. But digital signal processing, for example, is a precursor to how you would do transformational mathematics. It's the kind of thing that you would see, for example, in seismic processing. So now I have a seismic database, uh, a file, and I operate on it using uh, seismic processing techniques, which would uh, incorporate these kinds of approaches. And it's a different way to do uh, analysis on that data, uh, contrary to what you would do in a conventional computing sense. Why would that be advantageous in uh, seismic processing? Well, now maybe I can put substantial amount of computing on board a ship. I don't have to wait for that ship to dock, transport data to a data center, and so on. I can do it essentially in near real time, right? A low power, because in a DNA world, I might be able to amass not hundreds or thousands of computing units, but maybe trillions of computing units where every unique DNA molecule that I create actually has some computational capability or in combination has tremendous amounts of computational capability. So scale, parallelism, um, low energy, uh, low footprint, all those things conspire to help me deploy computing into the field, if you will, as opposed to having to go back to a 
brick and mortar classic data center. And it may not have to do complete processing, maybe just does some filtering on the data I'm capturing in the field before I have to send the residue back to the data center. But anything that can speed up the uh, total time spent in the workflow is going to be advantageous. Can the models learn in the sense that, you know, you produce this chemicals or the structure to maybe filter this specific data or have this specific algorithm? Is it like fixed in the sense that, you know, there's, there's some like uh, algorithms or processing people will do, and then they'll put it on a local device, like an IOT so that it's really close to where the data is actually happening, but they have to just keep updating that one. Um, it doesn't really change or store or do anything. It's just this specific algorithm. Can, can they change after you make them? Can you write them to change after you make them and learn? Um, we, we think so in the same way that a classic deployment of a machine learning algorithm will learn depending on the data that it's exposed to in the wild. So what do you do in, in classic machine learning and deep learning? You train a model with historical data, um, and then you deploy a model into the wild. But that doesn't mean the only data that model ever sees is the same as what it was trained on initially. So it has to evolve over the course of time as it begins to observe new phenomenon that was outside the realm of what it saw initially. We think that can be echoed in some sense with DNA as well. Um, we're hopeful that the um, low amount of energy that we require and, and the density of footprint will eventually have some advantage in IoT kinds of devices. Our approach to DNA computing is not going to have utility in every context that one could imagine as well, right? And so we're in the process as we explore these initial forays into compute, we're looking at very specific domains of application to make sure that we don't inadvertently create some hype that never gets realized. It's just like the quantum stuff, right? The quantum stuff was, was motivated by one application, and now people are spending time looking at other kinds of applications, but they know a priori, again, as I said before, you're not going to deploy quantum to displace all von Neumann kinds of architectures. You know, it's not going to provide you a material advantage to try to do payroll with quantum. So we have to find the boundaries and the limits here to make sure the, the promise of DNA computing is not oversold. Now, from our, my perspective, the way you do that is you look at language and make a determination of how informative language is to the plans and strategies you create. So I'll give you an example. People say storage market. That phrase has zero value to me the way people use it. Storage market is, you know, pick a number, $50 billion a year, something like that. Our interest is how you look at behaviors within that gross market that provides insight to us that, that are discernible, observable to us, where we can actually provide some real value. So, for example, uh, we don't want to do hot storage, the stuff that you need access to instantaneously, because in the world of chemistry, you have a, a latency problem that you can't readily overcome. Um, similarly, when you look at archival, you don't look at it and say, oh, we can solve all problems in archival. That's probably also not true. So you have to burrow down under these gross appellations and find those domains of applicability where you can demonstrate real concrete value. And that's why we, 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 we put a focus on trying to flesh out these value parameters that govern DNA. And it has to do with energy, density, um, uh, you know, uh, this, this notion of preservability, longevity, uh, the lack of uh, obsolescence, all those kinds of factors and how they come to play begin to filter the marketplace in the general use to give you those categories where there's some real utility in the short and intermediate term. I will give you a concrete example. In Europe right now, there's an effort underway a corollary to what was done with the seed repository in the Arctic Circle to preserve seeds uh, in case catastrophe occurs, you know, where would you get the seeds to restart agriculture and plant life and things like that? There's a similar kind of activity going on right now where they're encoding music into tape 
to put into this uh, repository north of the Arctic Circle uh, for the preservation of music should some catastrophe occur. Um, that could also be done on DNA, right? And maybe it could be done in a way that's cheaper, uh, more effective, uh, more preservable over thousands of years or tens of thousands of years or whatever the, the time dimension is. So people are beginning to entertain how they can begin to take technology and carve out domains of applicability, like this music example today, which are, are, are kind of the way we think about things as well in catalog. We stay away from the grandiose pronouncements of markets and so on. And with our collaborators in uh, industry and commerce, we try to augur into the nature of the way they're running their business today, how they expect to run it in the future, and see what is it about DNA that could be uh, helpful to their to their future strategies. I've got so many questions. <laughs> sure. I, f I fully get um, the hype thing. And I, I'm acting like a small child trying to find the edges of, of where this is going to be useful so I can better understand it. It mm -hmm. seems to me, well, I think everyone would agree that there's just more and more data all the time. And as you get more and more data, like let's say we were monitoring the entire seismic activity of the whole earth and it was generating, I don't know, exabytes a second of, of real-time seismic data. And then yeah. you wanted to somehow filter that, right? Mm -hmm. It sounds like this DNA computing would be a good way to do that. Um, my question, one question I have, well, first of all, I'll ask that. Is that like a good example? You have a tremendous amount of data that you need to filter and this would be a good application for DNA computing? The answer is yes and no. Um, if, if you could affordably encode all that data into DNA, then filtering it with DNA capabilities would absolutely be a brilliant way to do it because the computational uh, behavior of DNA is such that it's unaffected by the size of data. So in other words, the amount of time it takes you to run an application, a DNA application on a megabyte of data is not going to be discernibly different than the amount of time it takes you to run on a gigabyte or an exabyte of data. So it's data volume varying effectively. So that part is good. The part that you have to worry about is, what does it cost you to encode all this data into DNA? How much chemistry is involved, et cetera, et cetera, and how long would this take? And I think that that's a long-term ambition to the DNA storage community. But the fact of the matter is most computing applications today do not worry about uh, operating on the totality of the world's data. So it's, it's very intriguing to say, well, you know, the world has yottabytes of data or zettabytes of data. And so this will be a panacea to that. Most work is done on megabytes of data in the world. You know, an MP3 file for music is about three megabytes, three megabytes, not three exabytes, not three yottabytes or anything like that. And the question is, can you run applications against three megabytes of data with DNA that would be useful? And the answer is yes, you can. And there's a lot more application activity going on on data in that relative domain of quantity than there is people operating on exabytes or, or even petabytes of data today. So there's, a, there's sort of this segmentation in the marketplace that people need to come to grips with in terms of the predicate of data volume as being the motivator for why you do things with DNA and, and, and sort of think about that in terms of, of time horizon, of when DNA will be able to operate on megabytes and gigabytes and terabytes and petabytes and exabytes, et cetera, before everybody gets wrapped around the axle saying, ah, it's the panacea to the world of yottabytes. No, 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 don't worry about that. That'll take care of itself down the road. What we need to worry about in the short term is how do we manage megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, and so on. And, um, and, and so that's the way we think about this and how we focus on it. Now, when you gave the example of maybe you know, some historical storage, um, or maybe if I'm a company and I have you come in and instead of using all of this tape backups, you come in and you write a bunch of data to me mm -hmm. or, or data for me, how do you actually physically give that data to me, is it? I'm assuming it's not like in a bag that says like data. Like, what what is it in? It's in a bag with liquid and a goldfish, and it's yours. To keep. 
<laughs> it, well, it could be that way, but we we probably give you uh, a tube, or we would give you a tube encapsulated in uh, a, a physical device for preservation. There are companies, by the way, that are beginning to emerge in the DNA industry that are focused on exactly the containers that you would put DNA in for transport preservation and so on. Not our business, it's the business of other companies. So that's one way to do it. That's if we were preserving it in its sort of liquid state, ready for uh, manipulation in some way. We could also dry it out, desiccate it, and we could actually deposit it on a uh, piece of paper, if you will, something like that. And you could reanimate it, if you will, with the right kinds of chemistry and so on. Um, or we could do some post-processing for you and we could actually render all that stuff into some digital form if you wanted to preserve it in some digital form. All those options are available to you. Uh, but most people, I think, will, for, for the sake of density, because by the way, once I transform it back to digital form, you're back into, let me build a warehouse to hold all my data. So I think most people will, will have it contained in some sort of liquid semi-liquid or desiccated form, um, and they'll manage their volumetric amount of data in that fashion. So, you know, I can take all the data in the world, I can put it in the bread box, if you will. And so that's pretty cool. Um, and, and, you know, you can keep your bread box in your kitchen, and uh, that'll be all the data in the world. So there you go. <laughs> be, be careful what? what you do with that bread box. I know. <laughs> When, um, like, are there any pieces of, of digital or of DNA, sorry, in museums or like a, like a tube of it? Like, can, how can somebody go see it? Well, uh, DNA is not visible to the naked eye. So what you would see is you would see a tube of clear liquid and somebody would say there's DNA inside. Right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> That's why our goldfish is named DNA. So when we put that in your bag, you can say DNA is inside and actually be truthful. Um, so you really can't see it that way. Um, and we, we have, by the way, for other purposes, we actually have desiccated DNA and put it on a piece of paper. But then all you have is a piece of paper. So the molecules are too small to be observable to the naked eye. And that's the intrinsic advantage of DNA in terms of really dealing with a volumetric problem of how you store data. So you have to sort of trust us in a certain sense that, yeah, there's DNA in this test tube. It's a good business idea. I'm going to start selling DNA on my website. Just <laughs> right. um, I, I love the fish thing. Yeah, I yeah. love the fish thing because, yeah. All right, last time we talked, I, I may be wrong, but I think you had said something along the lines of, like when you're processing this data, or you're, you're looking for a specific result, you can change chemistry things like maybe a color, like have it come out blue or red. Was mm -hmm. that something true? Okay. So I would say that is like a very basic visualization of data that you wouldn't actually need any sort of computers to see, right? You would just program it to be that way. You would mix it and you would see the result red or blue in the vial. Am I on the right track? Not quite. Okay. The, the, the idea of fluorescence or colors is still taking place at the molecular level. So you still wouldn't see it with the naked eye. You'd have to use scientific instruments that could detect it. And the, the instrument itself, by virtue of detecting it, could draw a conclusion about what it's seeing. And that conclusion might be about the content of the data that's being stored, or it might be something with respect to the computation that's taking place, that suddenly a color has changed, and so therefore, you know, it's gone from positive to negative or whatever the case might be. Um, we're doing a lot of experiments with fluorescence and colors and so on um, to find ways to more efficiently uh, decode DNA molecules. So there's nothing that like I could, you know, I have, you have the data over here, like the source mm -hmm. data, and then you have the tube with the algorithm or whatnot in it. The, the What do you call them? What do you call them when you put it in there? Like a program? I don't know what you would refer to it um, as. Yeah, we call it a DNA program. We actually haven't agreed on language yet. Oh. For <laughs> so you have a DNA program, a DNA yeah. model, right? There you go. Mm -hmm. And then you pour the data into the DNA model and it, you can't physically see like a color change if you had programmed one. You would need some sort of instrument, correct? Correct. You're saying? 
Yeah. Oh, uh, okay. Even fluorescence, like under floor, like you just, it, the, the genetic structure for the blue color is inside <laughs> there. I don't yeah. get it. So, so, so think of it this way. Uh, DNA is composed of four letters, A, G, C, and T, right? And the order of how these letters appear in the double helix have an impact on the nature of what that molecule is all about. Um, the current devices that read DNA read these letters, A, G, C, and T. And they do it with great precision because that's the way you're able to do uh, genomic analysis and so on. Um, in our particular case, we don't need to go down to that level of specificity, in part because of our encoding scheme using a predefined set of uh, DNA snippets, oligonucleotides, which we call components, that we um, uh, tie together to build a bigger molecule that carries the nature of what the data is in the bigger molecule. So we, we know what we're building these DNA molecules with. It's all synthetic. It's not from a living organism. Uh, it's not uh, biologically active or anything like that. And all we're doing is we're experimenting with colors and fluorescence so that we don't have to go down to the decoding of a molecule to discern whether what the sequence of AGCTs are. We can simply say, you know, every, every 30 base pairs, if you will, if I see the color red, it means I've used this piece of DNA. And if I see the color yellow, figuratively speaking, of course, I, I've used this other uh, thing out of our DNA alphabet that we use. So the exploration of color, fluorescence, and so on, for us, is very much a function of the scheme that we've used to encode data. This is not for everybody, right? It's, our, it's mapped to our specific encoding scheme. If somebody wanted to encode data a different way, they might still experiment with colors, fluorescence, and so on, but it might be for an entirely different purpose. Net-net to -net, uh, what you're saying, however, is this. The quantities we're dealing with and the variations we're dealing with are so great in number that having colors available to you isn't going to offer you much because you're not going to be able to discern uh, a, a, a trillion different molecules with a trillion different colors. Your eyes can't tell a difference between a trillion different colors. You have to use scientific instruments that can make those small discernments of difference to help you understand what you're really seeing. So for us, it's a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. It's not something that's going to be visible to you. And even if it were visible to you, you wouldn't be able to have the ability to discern things at that level of detail that would help you at all. Okay, so let me help. I'm going to try to figure out the stack. Here we go. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the base layer, the raw, is like the actual for the letters, right? The DNA sequencing letters. Then yeah. you have some sort of abstraction, which I think you called like these snippets of how you sort of encode specially with them. And then on top of that, you have some sort of like domain specific layer with colors that help you understand those, or is that wrong? Let, let me explain it this way. Uh, let's see if I have a good, good example or a good metaphor for this. Um, First of all, let's agree that none of us can visibly observe a DNA molecule without the, the aid of a scientific in, instrument of some sort. Um, if we can't observe a DNA molecule, we can't really observe the AGCs and Ts in, in, in any effective way either. They're smaller than the DNA molecule by implication. Okay. Um, now, in our case, we operate at a level of agglomeration of about 30 base pairs at a time. Each of these is the small piece of a DNA molecule that we refer to, our nomenclature is a component. Think of it as an alphabet, right? So, you know, the English language has an alphabet from A to Z. And I always get the count confused between number of letters and number of teeth. So I don't know whether it's 24 or 26, but I have to count them. But it's some number of, of letters. And by ordering the way the letters appear, you create words and that's information. What we're doing is we have an alphabet 144 uh, in number of these little components of DNA. Each differs from the other, just like 
A differs from B. And by virtue of the order that we link them together, we create a word, if you will, that, that, um, that depicts some information. So if it's component one coupled with component three coupled with component four, that's different than one coupled with two coupled with 12, right? It's no different than if you said ABC is different than AML, right? So it's the same length, but because the components in both of those cases are different, they connote something different. Okay, so far, so good. So we're so our ability to to operate is at these uh, collections of DNA snippets. We call these identifiers. Now we know all the letters that are invoked because we supplied the letters. These are not just random pieces of DNA. And for us to say what word am I representing here? What piece of information am I representing here? I don't need to go down to the level of the A, G, C's, and T's. I just need to know whether I use component one, three, and four, or component one, 17, and 144. And if I can put an identifier on each of these 144 letters, right, I can stay away from having to go down to the level of all these A, G, C's, and T's. So it's an aggregation of representation that I'm searching for here. And if I can put a color on it that says, well, uh, the letter A in my DNA alphabet, the component one, is going to be lab labeled with a color pink, figuratively speaking. There's a little more to it than, than just conventional colors. And if um, component two is purple and component three is yellow and on and on it goes, then if I can look at a molecule, instead of having going, instead of going to each of these AGCs and Ts, meaning I would have to go through 500 of these, now instead of going through 500, I can go to maybe 16 different colors. And I can say, oh, that color scheme of 16 says that I'm looking at this piece of information. If I use a conventional genomic sequencer, I have to look at all the A, G, C's, and T's in detail, meaning roughly 500, to, to identify what information I'm looking at. So it's a matter of automation and scaling that is causing us to look at, can we identify snippets of DNA without having to go below the surface and look at all the A, G, C's, and T's and what order they're in? And one way to do that is to append something to each of these snippets, a little bit of fluorescence, a color, what have you, that says, ah, now I can look at something at a much more aggregate level and discern what it is. Um, does that help? Oh, I got it. Yeah, I'm good now. Yeah, okay. so now I've got one, I've got a clarifying question. Sure. Um, okay, so like we said before, you have, you have the raw data, you have your snippets, and then you have these, these colors aren't, uh, these colors are a way to see what, uh, identify a collection of snippets. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. And um, and so not 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 the specific like data within a snippet. It's used to identify a collection of snippets. Right. Color. Okay. Great. Now this um in in like the I think you said your alphabet was like 144 characters or the snippets were yeah. like 144 characters. So mm -hmm. there's you you would associate a different. Uh, color or fluorescent or something with each one of the 144 and Correct. you can step back and look at it and have an idea of where you're at with your data. Yeah. Another way to think of it is think of a Lego stack. Okay. Mm -hmm. So imagine if you will, a collection of Legos in a dark room, you can't tell their colors, but they're all the same size and you can stack them to a reasonable height. Let's say 16 high. If you turn the light on, uh, assuming that you bought you know, conventional Legos, they, there would be different colors in the different stacks you composed. And you could discern one stack from another by the sequence of colors in the stack. Um, you would start at the top, you would say, oh, this stack of 16 Legos is red, yellow, green, blue, etc. The next one is white, uh, purple, red, yellow. And by virtue of that, you could tell one stack from the other. As soon as you can find a scheme to identify one stack from another, you can effectively uh, have a scheme to encode data into these stacks of Legos, right? 
and um, and and you and you would decode it by virtue of having a key somewhere that says these colors correspond to the following uh, pieces of Legos, and that dictates what I'm looking at here, and, and that's it, right? So it's it's nothing different than looking at Lego stacks, except here instead of Legos, our each individual Lego is a piece of DNA, and each piece of DNA has a color map to it, and by virtue of that, I can then look at a stack of DNA or a length of longer DNA co composed of these smaller pieces. And that sequence of colors will tell me exactly what I'm looking at. That is a great, great example because there's Legos all over my house. Yeah. <laughs> um, Your kids are encoding data and you don't even know that. <laughs> I know last night they made some camel. They made a camel and my daughter brought it up to me. And I was, I said, how did you learn how to do this? And she goes, it, she goes instructions. It was in, and I go, and she, but she said it wrong. And I go, what do you mean instructions? And she brought over the side of the bag and pointed it, pointed at it. Right. I said, oh, you just looked at that and built it. There we go. That makes me happy. <laughs> That's right. So it's a, a recipe, and we have a recipe in our world, uh, which is algorithmic software and everything else that instructs our uh, our writing device, which we call Shannon, to um, build these longer length DNA molecules. So it's the same thing. You know, we have instructions. They're encoded in software. We hit go. It orchestrates the chemical activity inside the machine. And we produce out of that this collection of composed molecules, which each of which can, contains a unique piece of uh, data. I just thought about, I was thinking about security just now as you were talking about this, because you could have keys that are like terabyte size keys. Mm -hmm. Right. And to the security on this, and especially like, so you got that aspect and then you have the, the concept that, you know, this could each company or each customer have its own unique colored alphabet, like the one in 144 characters be in different colors, or is it the language at catalog? Um, there's a lot of ways to manipulate that for sure. Um, and it would be a matter of cost, scale and effort, but yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we could, we could um, change a lot of schemes that are specific to an individual, uh, but also we've also creating an we're also creating an environment which is secure in a different kind of sense, right? So I'm doing computing data in a chemical construct uh, in a vat somewhere. How do you hack that, right? Um, you don't know the encoding scheme. You don't have physical access to the chemistry. Um, you don't have any idea of what the stochastic elements are that are going on in this soup of chemistry going on, it'd be a pretty interesting kind of conundrum a hacker would face to figure out what's going on. Now, eventually you have to produce results and you could say, well, maybe I can hack the step that involves producing the results because I want to see a report that I want to read or something like that. And you could, you could invoke um, conventional encryption for that kind of step. But the, the compute process per se, the encoding process per se, that's uh, pretty hacker resistant. The work that you're doing, um, do you think it's going, or do you think it has the potential to help us understand our own DNA as humans better? So, so we operate at a scale quite a bit removed from human DNA in the following sense. The DNA molecules we synthetically build Again, synthetic means they're not biological in origin, nor are, nor are they capable of being rendered biologically active be because we put stops in the molecules and so on. It would make, make it impossible effectively to turn into a biologically active device. But for thermodynamic and other reasons, the length of the DNA molecules we construct are about 500 base pairs in length. Okay, uh, Human is 3.5 billion. So we, we can't use these techniques to build uh, human DNA, for example. On the other hand, um, the uh, pioneering work that we're doing in terms of uh, synthesizing DNA molecules and so on might be very good for people doing classic biological research in terms of providing faster ways to create uh, probes at scale and, and this and that. So it might be an adjunct capability that one could use to study human DNA, but we operate at dramatically different scales. Yeah, and I, I didn't want to confuse the two, but 
to me, it just seems, you know, I've been watching catalog for at least four years, uh, very excited about the, the progress that they've made as far as the speed of timing and encoding and decoding DNA. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, I would just imagine it would be, I, I would find it hard to believe that all of this advancements that you guys are making in the world of DNA isn't any use at all to us as humans understanding our own DNA. There seems like there has to be some, some, at least inspiration, if nonetheless, to help people who are working on human DNA to see how you guys are manipulating DNA or understanding it. Yeah, I, 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 to, to your point, I, I would make the following nebulous comment. <laughs> nebulous <laughs> for what I hope will become apparent reasons. There are um, research-based rules of thumb that govern um, our understanding of how DNA behaves, how it can be manipulated, and so on. I would submit that it is likely that um, an operation like ours, which is operating at scale, it goes quite far beyond what people do in conventional DNA research, might, um, might display phenomenon or make visible phenomenon that would put some of that rule of thumb theory in question. Now, what, why, why am I saying this? We do 500,000 DNA um, uh, chemical steps per second. Okay. Now, you could argue we're actually doing uh, 8 million a second because when I say what I'm, what I'm talking about here is the ligation or the connecting together of these pieces of the DNA alphabet we have. And we do 16 of these at a time. Uh, 500,000 times per second, okay? Now, that's at a scale that goes beyond what anybody else is doing with respect to the manipulation of DNA, regardless of how complex a DNA molecule is and so on. And I think that um, the prudent thing to observe would be the following. An idea stolen from the world of computing. Um, because certainly this was true during my career at IBM as we were building supercomputers. And that was that every design we did was perfect on paper. And then you built it. And then you found out there are all sorts of phenomenon that manifested themselves that you never anticipated because things happen at scale that you don't see in the absence of scale, right? Um, it's, it's no different than uh, in my personal case. So, my resting heart rate is 50 beats a minute, okay? Um, there are electrical anomalies in my heart that are irrelevant to my health that if my resting heartbeat was 70 beats a minute, no, no one would ever see, right? And believe me, the anomalies are absolutely irrelevant. This is not, <laughs> I'm not sick or anything like that. <laughs> but as you, as, you, as you move between these different sort of domains of measurement, you see things that you might not see otherwise. Think of the tides in the ocean. You know, the tide goes out and suddenly you see structures on the floor of the ocean that you never knew were there, that never bothered you before. But now that you see them, you pay attention to them because, oh, well, I can't, you know, sail my boat at this hour of the day because of the tides. But for most of the day, you're sailing on the surface of the water, totally oblivious to what's below you because it doesn't matter. Right. And all I'm saying here is that in the world of DNA, DNA research, human DNA, uh, health applications and so on, it would be prudent to expect that as we start pushing the boundaries of DNA chemistry at levels of scale that no one ever has experienced before, you are bound to observe something anomalous to what the theory has told you to believe. I got it. I'm good. Uh, change, change of question here. Yeah. You know, as we're sitting here talking about DNA, quantum computing, traditional computing, when I, I have less than 15 hours of education in quantum computing. So I'm very naive. Like I don't know a lot at all about quantum computing, mm -hmm. but when I got to talk to Robert Suter about one of his books, he was writing on quantum computing. He, um, had said that, uh, one of the things that could be potentially useful for, because 
I find our conversation with Robert very similar to you. Everyone seems to try to pull you to be something that you're not and hype it up. But so, so to bring it back, um, Robert was saying that for things like maybe modeling molecules, right? It might be exceptionally fast there because from what I took, the current way the scientific community will do it when drug testing is they use a traditional computer and they try to make this like virtualization of molecules and how they interact. But it's very, very basic and it contains very little of what the actual molecules are and how they interact. But if you, in quantum computing, you'd be able to do that in a much richer environment, right? Mm -hmm. So taking that for what it is, um, and, and right now people are comfortable with this concept of using traditional computers to interact with quantum computers because of things like, you know, I think Microsoft and a couple other companies, Honeywell, they did, you know, quantum APIs where you can actually go run things on quantum computers mm -hmm. in the cloud type deal. Okay. So with those, those things in mind, do you ever think that maybe the company will end up as like a quantum software play because like when, when quantum technology advances far enough to be able to richly create and interact with these representations of these molecules that they could then take all of the catalog DNA knowledge and put that on top of it. And now they can do that in some quantum space, or is that just like insanity? Um. <clears throat> I wouldn't go too far down the path of the merging of what we're doing with quantum at this point, but I would tell, I, I would, I would answer you in the following way. There are a lot of lessons being pioneered in quantum that weigh on us in terms of how we think about the development of technology and DNA for reasons I alluded to at the beginning with respect to what's presumptively an exotic technology at a certain point in time, but holds promise to do something quite dramatically important uh, somewhat down the road. So we're thinking about software a lot in terms of, for example, what, what the software paradigm would be to invoke these chemical instructions that we're creating. How, how would you do that? What is the nature of the API that would allow you to orchestrate that kind of activity? And so in calendar year 2022, this year, uh, our hope is that we'll create, much like the quantum guys did at IBM, an emulator for how to do computing with DNA in the context of the, the catalog encoding scheme, et cetera. We don't know a priori whether it's generalizable to an arbitrary set of DNA encoding schemes, but we need to do it at least once to stimulate the community to begin thinking about how one should do this, how, how, we, how we should go about it, where should standards be, where should they be avoided, and so on. And I think IBM and Bob Suter is an ex-colleague of mine, did a lot of right things here with respect to stimulating the community to really help in aggregate explore a lot of things with respect not only to the nature of what SDK should look like and API should look like, but also the application domains that uh, this technology could be applied to. Um, we, we hope to follow in those footsteps to a certain degree and leverage a community to help us and the community at large get a better understanding of how you do things with DNA as well. This is such an exciting time to see all of these new technologies progressing at such a rapid pace. I'm super happy to be alive right now. <laughs> <laughs> better than the alternative. Right. <laughs> Oh man, this is good. So I want to make sure that we get everything covered that you also wanted to, to get covered here on the show. I had a bunch of questions. I was like kid in the candy shop. Thank you so much um, for, mm -hmm. for uh, indulging me. What sort of message do you want to get out to the world? I think, I think from the perspective of catalog, the message we want to get out to the world is that you will see material progress on computing with DNA in 2022. And by material progress, I'll define that as working on a real world problem at scale. So uh, different than a toy problem, there have been academic papers on toy problems and so on using bench chemistry, et cetera. We're looking to do something at scale so that one can look at it and evaluate the progress on its merits and not have to get out pencil and paper and say, well, if I extrapolated this to the real world, it would look like this, et cetera. 
Now, we want to take that away. We want to solve one real world problem at scale in 22. And I think that's an important um, goal that we've set for ourselves. Uh, we, have, we have a long ways to go. Uh, we would expect to begin to, to um, publish results prior to the end of the year in terms of the path we're taking and, and where we're headed. Uh, but that's 22 for catalog. We want to show people what the possibilities are with compute. That's exciting. And then you get to come on next year and tell us about it. <laughs> oh, next year, uh, we should tell you about a lot of different applications in the DNA compute space. And hopefully in 23, we're on the verge of getting to a commercial offering of some sort. Have you, I mean, you're, you're going to have something commercial. You said by 2025, I think I read in the press release, there hopes to be commercial things by 2025. Yeah, um, we'd like to do something experimentally in the marketplace in 23, but yeah, we would expect to be pretty commercial by 25. Given the fact that I'm an impatient person, I always think like <laughs> farther ahead. Uh, so I'm thinking about scaling and talent. You just brought that up, right? Because of the way the education system is set up. And I was just curious, have, when I was searching to try to prepare for the interview and I, I was trying to search for, you know, catalog DNA computing versus DNA storage to try to understand these differences because everywhere in the press release, it just said catalog DNA and compute or catalog storage and computing. And I was like, yeah. well, where's the and computing? This is just a press release about them <laughs> raising money. I didn't pick up on it. And yeah. then I started trying to figure out what it was in general and man, pages of results. And then finally I found some YouTube of, of some uh, person trying to explain uh, DNA computing and they just explained what storage was. And I was like, okay, there is a huge opportunity for education. I was curious, have you, have you guys talked internally about, you know, how you're going to handle the education gap uh, to gain talent at a rapid pace? Um, yes. So uh, in, in many, many different ways, um, you'll see, for example, active participation by catalog this year in a variety of venues, both domestically and internationally, where we begin to unveil some of the nature of, of the things that we're doing. Um, you'll, see, you'll see us publishing more things, at least in lay press, if you will. Uh, and the reason I say that is not because we haven't been thoughtful to you know, referee status kinds of publications, but we're moving at a much different pace than what university researchers are and so on. Um, and, uh, and so we're not that interested in, in referee journals, et cetera. Uh, this is all pragmatic. So there's going to be a lot of outreach in that fashion. We have some activities queued up beginning pretty soon with universities reaching out broader into the university communities to let them know what we're doing, to both intrigue them as potential collaborators, but also to motivate students to begin to get thoughtful about how they orchestrate their own educational programs to be able to do things like this. So yeah, it's gonna be a long slog, but at the end of the day, nothing breeds interest more than success. And so the extent to which we can produce results and demonstrate value and so on will go a long way towards uh, you know, motivating interest for people to move in this direction. You know, the quantum field, listen, IBM been working on quantum for five decades, right? But it's really only been in the last 10 years or so where, um, you know, you've got quantum devices and you've got SDKs and you've got emulators and all these other things. And you've got notable applications that can be pursued with quantum that has suddenly sort of sparked interest beyond where things were in, you know, 2001 or 1991 or 1981, right? Because now people can taste it, they can touch it, they can feel it, they can begin to play with it and so on. And I think that as we get to that level where we move away from the abstractions that have been so prevalent about DNA computing and storage today, that's it. Now, with respect to DNA computing per se, I think the seminal paper on this goes back maybe to 1996, traveling salesman problem. Okay. Um, and there have been some other academic things since. But uh, one of the reasons why we went, of our, went out of our way to mention computing in our announcements last fall was to signal to the world that we're here, 
and computing is coming and people should start thinking about this. Um, we think DNA storage as an endeavor per se is nothing more than a stepping stone to create the notion of truly active devices that uh, link storage and compute in the same environment, operating continuously at low power all the time. That's where we're headed, right? The idea of having passive storage, eh, okay, fine. Um, the idea of having passive storage in support of compute, okay, fine. But these classic paradigms, there's no reason they should exist that way. Why not have everything in one environment doing everything at the same time? And that's us. <laughs>